five, four, three, two, one. And liftoff at dawn, the dawn of Orion and a new era of American space exploration. was the launch of EFT-1, the first flight of the Orion multi-purpose crew vehicle. And today is two years since the launch of that mission. So that's what we're talking about today. Let's get to it. Now because this is the rocket blog, we're not going to be talking about the technical details of EFT-1. And quite frankly, there aren't that many technical details to discuss. Instead, we're going to be talking about my memories of that mission. Because this morning, when I heard today was two years since that mission, I had a flashback to all those moments, and I just had to tell that story. So first off, for those of you that don't know, EFT-1 was an unmanned two-orbit mission. Launched atop a Delta IV heavy rocket, the Orion crew vehicle went into its first orbit, a slow parking orbit, before the relight of the Delta IV upper stage to put it on a high elliptical re-entry orbit. Purpose of this was to get the crew vehicle to re-enter Earth's atmosphere at a speed roughly similar to what it would if it was coming back from the moon or an interplanetary mission. EFT-1 was all about that re-entry. The purpose of EFT-1 was primarily to test the heat shield of Orion. The first test of Orion as a whole won't be until the Exploration Mission 1 in 2018. Now the first fond memory I have of this mission is the fact that it was supposed to launch a day earlier. The launch was originally scheduled for 7 a.m. on December 4th, and launch coverage began on NASA television at 4.30 a.m. Now me, being a complete rocket geek, got up at 4 a.m. to watch that coverage even though I knew it wasn't launching until about 7. I remember for those three hours before the launch, I mainly just, you know, watched the broadcast and did homework. Then as the mission got closer to launch, I went downstairs, turned on the TV, and got ready to watch the launch with my family. Unfortunately, the launch was then delayed till the next day. The next day, I did not get up at 4 a.m. Launch coverage didn't start until about 6.30 that day, but if it had started earlier, I would have probably gotten up. Now, the next day, December 5th, the launch did go off as planned at around 7 o'clock that morning. The only problem was our internet managed to cut out at exactly T0, so I missed the liftoff itself, but luckily, our uh, internet came back at around T plus 5 seconds, so I was able to watch the majority of the ascent. Now this day, I did actually have classes, but luckily, but after launch, there isn't much going on on EFT-1. It's really just coasting through space. So I was able to go to classes, pay attention without being distracted by this historic mission, and after class, I was able to open the broadcast and watch the vehicle re-enter and land. I, I, I distinctly remember, you know, watching that vehicle descend through the clouds under parachutes and splash down in the ocean. It, I, I probably will forever remember that because that was the first flight of what will eventually bring NASA astronauts to Mars. Now, whether they're the first astronauts to walk on the Martian surface is yet to be seen, because there now are a few other uh, contenders in that big next step. So where are we two years after EFT-1? The capsule was successfully recovered after the mission, and NASA has since carefully studied the vehicle to see how it handled re-entry, and what design changes do they need to make before the next mission. While the design of the heat shield itself is primarily staying the way it is, the design for the heat protection system around the rest of the capsule is changing. The original EFT-1 mission flew with a series of black tiles to make up the majority of the insulation around the back side of... 
empty one flew with a series of black tiles around the majority of the vehicle. NASA has since decided that they want to go back instead to an ablative material similar to what was flown on the Apollo missions, and as a result, the capsule will have a silver metallic finish, uh, which in my opinion actually it looks a lot cooler. So yeah, two years later we haven't flown in another Orion vehicle since. The next one isn't slated for another two years, unfortunately. Now moving on to other more recent topics, a few weeks ago I got to watch the launch of the Ghost R mission from Cape Canaveral. The great thing about going to school here in Florida is I can see launches. Now that launch was pretty cool to see. It was a night launch it was delayed for an hour. It literally launched at the very end of the launch window, which, to say the least, was stressful. As always, the best part of the launch was the sound. The roar of the RD-180 main engine, coupled with the four solid rocket motors, it, it was quite an awesome sound. Now, a quick question for the, you viewers. On this channel, I have two main series. This series, the Rocket Blog, and my other series, The Science of Rockets. And I want to know, would you guys be interested in a third series focused around Kerbal Space Program? I was speaking to a friend earlier today about this YouTube channel, and he recommended doing a Kerbal series on this channel. And I thought I would ask you viewers if that's something you would like to see. So please comment below, let me know, would you like to see me playing Kerbal Space Program on this channel? It is a wonderful game. I know a lot of people at SpaceX actually play Kerbal, or at least that's what I've heard. I know engineers at NASA and the European Space Agency also play the game. It is a pretty good game for aerospace engineers. That's all for this video. If you enjoyed watching, please like the video. If you want to see more videos like this, please subscribe if you haven't already. And if you have any suggestions for anything else I can do on this channel, please comment below. I welcome your suggestions. Until then, see you next time.